Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final week of our class. It's uh, really hard to believe that it's uh, going to be over in less than uh, seven days. Uh, let me say I've enjoyed uh, learning uh, through the course, and more importantly, I've enjoyed meeting each one of you, and I do wish you well on your uh, journey to achieve your master's degree. It's a great uh, um, feat, and few people achieve it, so I wish you well. <clears throat> um, if you look on the syllabus, you'll see that there is a lot of reading this week in order for you to grasp the, the entire content of the course, and obviously I don't have the time to uh, talk about all of it. Uh, and honestly, even some of the stuff that I've got on my PowerPoint, I want to brush through them quickly because I, I really want to talk about culture. Uh, I feel as though that that's really a crux and, and would be very helpful for us as uh, leaders in kingdom-oriented uh, organizations. Uh, so first of all, let me just talk a little bit about organizational design. Uh, when we talk about design, it's the uh, purposeful uh, configuration of the organization to achieve organizational success. And uh, the design of the organization helps uh, those in the organization to develop and to deploy the organization's uh, specialties to address the human concerns in a changing environment. Now, the authors in the book say it a little bit differently, but I'm looking at it from a kingdom perspective. Uh, we're not in a for-profit situation, and our organizations are more mission-oriented. And so uh, we need to look at it from that particular uh, point of view. The organizational design focuses on the internal capabilities of the organization to uh, meet that mission. And that includes the structure, uh, the people, the leaders, the management, and everything that works together to help that organization achieve its mission. The, there's a difference between organizational development that we've been talking about and organizational design. So design involves the structure, it involves the networks, it involves the process, it involves the role of aligning the organization with the mission of the organization. Development has more to do with the people side of it. And I think, you know, if we looked at a computer, you've got hardware and software. Design would be the hardware and development would be the software. I, I think that that's a good way to look at it. And the, the STAR model is one of the models that, or the model that our textbook points out. And the STAR model uh, uses uh, basically the elements of strategy, structure, and process, and people, and rewards as the overall means to uh, address the design of the organization. And I'm going to leave that to you to uh, read through and muddle through all that. Um, my heart is to talk about culture, and specifically organizational culture. And, you know, in our churches, in the kingdom-oriented uh, organizations that we serve. Now, in the textbook, they talk about transformation, uh, organizational transformation and cultural change. And uh, I don't really want to talk necessarily about changing culture. Uh, if you're in a situation where it's, a, it's not a good culture, you're going to have to bring about change. But changing the culture and creating the culture basically go hand in hand. And I want to talk specifically to today with you about something stemming from my own personal experience as uh, an educator and as a pastor uh, in particular. When we talk about culture, culture is the shared beliefs and values that reflect how people within the organization think, okay? It, it's what they think, and it's kind of that shared idea. 
and understanding culture means that if we're going to bring about change in the culture, that we're talking about changing the way people believe and the things that they value. Now, not necessarily changing that they believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you know, those kinds of things, but changing the way that they believe, uh, the values that they hold within that organization, how they think, how they talk, how they act, all those things have to do with culture. And so people don't want to change. And, and so to change culture, we're really talking about changing uh, something that's soft, okay? If we were going to change an office and we were going in and removing at one desk and putting in another desk, that's a hard change, okay? It's something that's tangible. But when we talk about culture, we're talking about something that's more intangible. You can't you know, grab hold of it and put your hands on it. And so leadership is really crucial and the key element for culture development and cultural change. Now, the church that I'm pastoring right now, uh, and this is a, you know, for those of you who are thinking of uh, pastoring a church, really, if you go into an existing situation, you're walking into an established culture. And uh, the worst thing that you could do would be to go in and start changing things because you're going to be changing culture, even if you're just moving the piano from one side of the platform to the other. Uh, and so the thing to do, if you're going to go into an existing situation, would be not to change anything for several years, okay? It takes a lot of time to establish yourself as a leader so that people, number one, trust you, okay? And then number two, begin to follow your lead. So just because you're voted in as the pastor or just because you're voted in as the president of the college or whatever does not mean that you have the carte blanche to go in and start changing things. So uh, understand that the culture of the organization begins with you as the leader. The things that you believe, the things that you value, the things that you say on a repeated basis are going to be those things that become the, uh, the, the DNA of the culture of that organization. Now, I've got a really great illustration of this. Uh, recently, now, uh, I, you know, I pastor an Assemblies of God church. We're a classical Pentecostal church. Um, and, you know, we were like most churches where we want God to move, but, you know, it, it's not real demonstrative. It hasn't been. But the Lord, the Lord impressed upon me that uh, worship should be more extreme than what we, at least, had entered into. Uh, typically, in our church, uh, uh, a Sunday morning, we would sing some Bethel worship or Elevation worship type songs, and they were good, and uh, we enjoyed it. And but overall. It was kind of a quiet environment, if you know what I mean. I mean, there was a few people that raised their hands, and, and there were a few people that said amen and those kinds of things, but it wasn't real demonstrative. Well, this past uh, January, uh, I preached a message, a series of messages on shouting to the Lord, and I began to teach on this, and I began to demonstrate it myself by shouting praises during praise and worship. So I would, you know, shout out, praise God, thank you, Jesus, those kinds of things. And it wasn't just in a normal voice, it was in a shout. And I was preaching about this. Well, I'm telling you what, our church grabbed hold of that, okay? Now, I had been there for 15 years. And so I had been established as the leader and people trusted me. But our church now, just within a matter of since January the 1st, and here it is, February the 21st, has gone from moderate as far as being uh, vocal to what I would call a ruckus, okay? I mean, if people come to, as guests at our church, uh, they might think that they've stepped into really something different. Uh, and if they want to be quiet with their hands folded, they probably won't stay. 
And that's one of the things that I've had to wrestle with. You know, uh, there are going to be people who are, are in our church that may not want to be a part of that. We haven't had anybody leave yet, but we are more bo boisterous. Uh, it's becoming part of the culture of the church. And when we have guest speakers that come in or you know, we had a guest missionary last week, people comment about how uh, that culture is uh more exciting to them. Uh, another thing that I've worked hard at over the years is establishing a, a, a sense of acceptance. Uh, it's one of hi uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs that people want to feel accepted. And so I continually demonstrate this by accepting anybody that comes in and then also by Telling the people, we don't stand at the door with a clipboard making sure that you meet all of our criteria before we accept you and welcome you in. In other words, when you walk in the door, regardless of where you've been, we accept you as you are. We recently simulcasted the XO Marriage Conference, and we had people from other churches that came. And uh, the last day of the conference, Saturday, after it was all over, a gentleman from another church who was visiting with us said, I want you to know I feel loved and accepted, and I have from the first time I stepped onto your parking lot till I'm leaving. And that tells me that the people at our church are demonstrating their core values and their core beliefs are acceptance and demonstrating love. So as a leader, the behavior and the attitude that you project will be that which creates the culture that the people follow. So if you want to have a dynamic, uh, loving um, culture within your church, you have to be dynamic. You have to be loving. If you want to be a generous, have a generous culture in your church, you have to be generous. You have to demonstrate it. You have to be the one who leads the way. If you want your people to be missions-minded, you have to be missions-minded because people are going to follow you as the leader. You as the leader are the one who creates the culture. And if you're going into a situation that has an established culture, the worst thing that you can do is go in and start changing things. Okay? You want to go about it slowly. Use those change models that we talked about earlier in the class and begin small with your leaders and begin to establish the culture that you want to establish. Be purposeful in the establishment of a culture. Cultural, uh, organizational culture doesn't happen by accident. It happens by development and by design. All right. So I want to encourage you. As leaders, whether you're a leader of a church as the senior leader or whether you are a ministry leader, you can create a culture within your department or within the overall church that will reflect Jesus, okay? And that's what we want in kingdom-oriented organizations. We want to reflect a culture that demonstrates who Jesus really is. You know, I, I'm in an Assemblies of God church, and every Assemblies of God church is as different as the pastor is. I don't want to be like some other Assembly of God church. I want to be the Assembly of God church that represents Jesus well. I don't even want to be a good Assembly of God church. I want to be a good Jesus church, right? So you are the you are the leader. You are the one in charge of culture, and I just want to encourage you be purposeful to establish a culture in your uh, realm of influence that reflects Jesus. Love, accept, give, do what Jesus would do, right? That's all the time I've got. This 15 minutes goes quickly. But listen, I wish all of you the very best. Drop me a note every once in a while. Let me know how you're doing. If you're ever in Houston, please come visit us at at New Life Church in Kingwood, Texas. We'd love to have you. God bless you. Be sure to turn in your paper this Sunday. I'll get it graded as soon as I can. God bless you. I love you all. Bye-bye.